Well, this morning is the first week of December. As you can see, we've decorated, and everyone's in the Christmas spirit, I hope. And if not, maybe this morning might help you guys a little bit. We're going to sing a couple of Christmas songs together. So let's stand, please, if you can, and we'll, um, we'll sing some songs.
You guys may be seated. We're going to take communion here together. Others might be in the jubilation with joy. Wherever we at, we're at, we know that you will meet us there. Help us to solely focus on you. In Christ's name, amen. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it. This is my body. taken the cup and given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for the many Good morning. Uh, just a little bit of a lagging cough, and so I've got my cough drop right here ready to go. Um, I mean, I call them cough drops, but they're really Ludens, which are just cherry candy, and I love Ludens cough drops. So I remember as a kid, remember they used to come in little boxes, right? Do you remember like, oh, I could bring these to school because they're cough candy, I mean cough drops. Did anyone else do that besides me? Okay, there's a few of you. Okay, good. Deliciousness. Oh, I love them so much. Oh, <clears throat> anyway, I hadn't had any actually in years until this week, um, and I remembered how much I loved them. So we're going to begin today in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and when we're going to be around that area a lot. There'll be a lot of texts today, I'll warn you, um, but that's because it all ties together so very well, and it's so important to get it all in there. I'm going to read to you maybe a very famous verse to some of you, maybe the first time you've ever heard it, but that's where we'll begin. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, many of you have probably heard that verse before. If you've been around the church, then you've heard that. If you've not, then that might be the very first time you've ever heard it. And when I was challenged to put this message together several weeks ago, I read this verse and I instantly thought to today, in today's culture, if you were just out on a street corner and you read this verse... In today's culture, this verse doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't even make sense. The first two big words in this this verse of this chapter are words that are used in the church, in the church alone. They're not even used in society. And then it ends with a phrase that doesn't even make any worldly sense. So this verse doesn't make sense to the people that we're trying to tell about this verse. What do we do? Because this verse is so vital, it's so important to our faith that it must be understood. 
It must be shared with others. How can we do that in a way that other people can understand? How can I share it with you in a way today that you fully understand more than that so that you fully embrace this truth as your own in your life. So that no matter what life brings your way, you will accept this as truth, as a promise from God that he himself will take away your sins, that he alone is responsible for serving justice, that he has willingly taken him upon himself the punishment that we deserve so that we can be freed, so that we can be healed, so that you can be healed. Don't, don't hold it in. Don't try to get right on your own. Don't fight the battle alone. Come to God today and give it to him. See, Isaiah 53 reveals the price, if you will, of this big word called atonement, another word we do not use in the world today. I dare you to think of the last time you heard the word atonement, and it wasn't having to do with church. It is a big churchy world, a word, but th- this word is too important for us not to use it, so we must define it. The world defines atonement as a way to make amends or reparation for a wrong or an injury, to cover over an offense and to make things right. Now, as a follower of Jesus, we must know that atonement refers directly to our need for reconciliation or reunion between a sinful man, that's us, and a holy God. And this reconciliation is possible through and only through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is expressed in three places, all in, chap- in the book of Romans, pretty close together. Romans 5.11, 5.19, and 3.25. I'm going to read those three passages to you. Romans 3.25 says it this way. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance or his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand go unpunished. Romans 5.11, it is not, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Finally, Romans 5.19, for just as through the disobedience of one man, The many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the man, the one man, the many will be made righteous. Atonement is one of the Bible's most central themes, that God has provided a way for all of humankind to come back into a a harmonious, unified relationship with him. The truth is found throughout all of scriptures, from the very first stories in Genesis to the last visions of Revelation. God seeks to reconcile his people to himself. In the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that God made with his people, the concept of his atonement is found throughout, specifically in Exodus and Leviticus. The most important of all of these is found in Leviticus chapter 23, beginning of verse 27. The Lord said to Moses, the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Now, today, the Jews call this most holy day Yom Kippur. You've all seen it on your calendars and said, well, what does this even mean? I don't even know that language. You're correct. This means day of atonement. It was a day set aside. It was one of the most solemn, holy days where the high priest would come before and perform these elaborate rituals to atone for the sins of the people. This would all happen once a year. The details of what took place, if you'd like to read them, can all be found in Leviticus chapter 16. It involved first the blood sacrifice of a bull. Then secondly, the sacrifice of two male goats. The high priest would take the two male goats, present them to the Lord. One goat would be a sin offering for the people. The blood of that goat would be sacrificed and be brought into the atonement cover in the most holy place in the temple. The second goat served a rather different purpose. The priest would lay both of his hands upon the head of that goat and cast over that goat, confess all of the wickedness, the rebellion, the evil of the Israelites, all of their sins, put them on that goat's head, and then send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for that task. 
The goat would then carry on itself the sins of all of Israel to that remote place and then would be released. This is where we get our term, scapegoat. If you ever wondered, this is where it came from. And it says, this will be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites, Leviticus 6, 34. Now, in today's culture, when we read about blood sacrifices and these things from the Old Testament, we find these things repulsive and unimaginable. How awful it must have been to live in a culture where that was practiced. Why would God even require such a thing? As a matter of fact, there's a group of our population that refuses to even believe in God because of these kinds of things. They don't want to have anything to do with a God that would require such a barbaric system to gain some kind of forgiveness for something. They don't understand that. And here's what I get. I get that feeling if that's all that you know about God. It does sound offensive. You know why? Because it is. We got to understand this reality. Sin is offensive, very offensive to God. And we must also understand that this was not God's original design to include these sacrifices. The old system of law was not what God wanted. It was a path that we humans chose. We brought sin into the world through our actions, and our God, through his grace and his mercy, made it possible for that sin to be forgiven. Atonement. We owe a debt to God for our sin, and God requires that that debt be paid. But instead of forcing us to pay the debt, he offers another way, an atoning sacrifice on our behalf. Fortunately, the Old Testament law, it says, was only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, be <clears throat> repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Jesus, the light of the world, cast off the shadow and offered himself as an atoning sacrifice once and for all for mankind. It is impossible for the blood of bull and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It's from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 7, 27, unlike the other high priests, he does not need, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, because he never sinned, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. His atoning, debt-paying sacrifice is once and for all. But it's a gift that you and I, we've got to choose to accept. It's a path that we have to choose to walk down. We must choose Jesus. We must accept his atoning sacrifice. We must admit that we need him, that we are not good enough, that we cannot make it on our own without his redeeming work on the cross. All of that leads us right back to where we started an explanation of Isaiah 53, 5. This passage is absolutely essential, foundational even to our faith. And so my prayer is that we, as we explain it today, that God will open your mind and your heart in a way that moves you, first, to fully and accept it and embrace it for yourself, yes, but second, places a desire within your heart to run out and share this truth with others in a way they can understand it. Because time is short, my friends. None of us know how long. This is an urgent issue. The time is now, and Jesus is challenging you with this truth today. In order to begin, we need to do just a short recap of this entire passage. 
Context is king in scripture. We must understand what this Bible verse is all about. Knowing a Bible verse, great, that's a wonderful place to start. But we must learn where it's from. We must learn the rest of the story that surrounds it. We must learn about the author who wrote it. We must learn about how this passage fits in with the overall nature of our God and the rest of the story of the entire Bible. This passage is written within the book of Isaiah, a very, very famous Old Testament prophet. It's part of a section of passages, four passages, that are often called the servant or suffering servant songs that Isaiah wrote. They're all found in this book of Isaiah, and here are the four places they are found. We're only going to study one of them today. Feel free to read the rest of these suffering servant passages on your own. They're found in Isaiah 42. Verses 1 through 4. They're found in Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. And then the passage we'll read today, Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 53, 12. Each of these servant songs help paint a, a portrait of our Jesus. They offer very specific prophecies about all that Jesus would do and who he would be, how he would suffer and ultimately die. And our key passage from today, chapter 53, verse 5, comes in kind of the middle of that fourth song. In order to understand the depth of that verse tucked in the middle, you've got to read it in context with the rest of this suffering servant song. So that's what we're going to do. Isaiah 52, verse 13, is where we will start. See, my servant will act wisely. So it's all describing Jesus He'll be raised up and lifted up, highly exalted. Think of the crowds coming to him. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who? Has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that he we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like the one from whom people hide their faces, he, Jesus, was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took upon, <coughs> excuse me, up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was the punishment that, was brought, that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered among the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and was made an intercession for the transgressors. Now, that is a beautiful yet terrible portrait of what lied ahead for our Jesus, our atoning sacrifice. Our focus today is just on verse five. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
The nails that went through my Jesus' hands and feet are there because of my sin, my violation of the law, my rebellion against my loving God who sent his one and only son to willingly die for me. Jesus was crushed for my iniquities. What on earth is the difference between an iniquity and a transgression and a sin and all of these big churchy words? Well, you might have heard the word sin defined as in this very simple way, as missing the mark. That word sin that we use there is an old archery term. It's true, and it does mean to miss the mark. But there's one small problem with that definition. It's not the full definition If you're an archer, you know you can miss the mark ever so slightly and still be rewarded. Score quite well, actually. The difference is when we miss the mark, when we sin, we we miss God's mark and we miss God's standard. And God's standard is nothing short of perfection. You see, sin is any thought, word, or action that is in a disobedience to the will of God. And an iniquity is, is even a little deeper. It's the, the dirtiness that kind of lives inside of us when we've engaged in that sin, the type of sin that's related to our innermost character, our innermost being, our moral uncleanliness that goes along with it. It's often related to our intentional twisting or defiance of God's standard. Yeah, I said it. We do it on purpose, don't we? So by default, we intentionally crush our Jesus. The result? Well, this is why we must know our God. We must seek to understand who he is. We must seek to understand his law and his character. Once we do, the next part of this verse makes sense, but it does not make sense to an unbelieving world. Apart from divine revelation, it can't make sense to someone living by the ways of 2023. Verse 5, it continues, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. Now, how could him, Jesus, taking my punishment, bring me peace? Think about it from a worldly perspective. It doesn't make any sense at all. But Jesus, taking my punishment, brings me peace with God. I am no longer at odds with the creator of the universe. Make it personal. I am no longer at odds with my creator. I am no longer in an eternal debt to someone that I could never repay. Think about that. Does that bring you peace? Now, a very simple worldly example of this might be paying off some kind of financial debt in your life. Have any of you ever done that? Remember making that last payment? <sighs> It just felt so good until you had to buy the next car. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, that was just a temporary monetary obligation. What we're discussing is an eternal debt that you can never repay. It's more hopeless than a thousand-year mortgage with a 500% interest rate. You can't do it. I can't do it on my own. But the Son of God came along, and he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. He took the punishment that brought me peace, and by his wounds, I can be healed. (laughs) Jesus suffered physically. He suffered mentally. He suffered emotionally through all the elements leading up to and including the cross. His flesh torn, pierced, maybe stabbed is a better reminder for you. His body crushed under the brutal blows of a whip's and other instruments of torture that were used against him. His body literally crushed under the weight of the Roman cross that he began to carry toward Golgotha. The mental anguish of the crowd all turning on him, choosing him, an innocent man, over for death, over a known murderer. Why the crowd cheered for his execution, cheering on the Roman soldiers that they would inflict more and more pain than I could ever even imagine. He suffered all of that and more, his body broken and wounded, so that I could be healed, so that my wounds could be healed, so that God could come into my life and restore my soul, so that my scars, my pain, my guilt, my shame can all be taken away from me. All because someone else willingly suffered in my place. 
so that I didn't have to, and so that you don't have to. Today, Jesus wants you to know that he was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. He was punishment that he took brought you peace so that by his wounds you can be healed. Do you want to be healed? Don't you want to be made well? To be very honest, some of us do and some of us don't. And I can't understand the don't side yet either, but everybody's in their own place in life. It's up to the Spirit to move you in that direction. Sure, the sin in your life might make you feel bad at times, but do you really want to get well? So many times, so many of us humans, that is where we sit, unwilling to pursue the help that we genuinely need. In John 5, Jesus approaches this this beggar, this cripple at the pool of Bethesda. It says the man had been an invalid for 38 years. Jesus, the Son of God, comes to the man. He asks him a simple question. Do you want to get well? Jesus, God's own Son, asked him this question. And do you know what the man did? He made up a whole bunch of excuses as to why he hasn't been made well already. That's how he answered Jesus' question. He never actually answered Jesus. And do you know what Jesus did? He ignored the man's excuses. And he commanded him to get up, pick up his mat, and walk. Now, what we often don't think about is that man still had a choice, didn't he? He didn't have to get up. He made all the excuses in the world. He didn't have to get up. But he got up, and he walked away celebrating and rejoicing, even after all the excuses. And Jesus can do the same thing with you today. You might have brought in your big bag of excuses with you today. And Jesus says, I don't care. (laughs) Get up, take your mat, and walk out of here. And that's what he wants to do. Jesus was not pierced and crushed and wounded and killed so that we could give him excuses. He's already paid the price. He is our atoning sacrifice. We must only accept the gift and allow his wounds to heal us. Amen. Every author in the New Testament except for James and Jude take time in at least one of their letters to write about this part of God's plan. That Jesus would take our place. That Jesus would take our punishment. That Jesus would make things right between me and God, between you and God. That Jesus, through his wounds, would heal ours. If you've been here a while, then you know something, because it happens almost every week. When you're reading the word of God, if something's repeated, it's every week. That just seems to happen. I wonder why. Hmm. Why do you suppose that all of these men in all of the New Testament just kept driving this point home? Because God wants us to know it. Because he knows that we humans have a tendency to forget things, um, to ignore things, or worse, to, uh, to just twist the truth of his word. And he doesn't want us to ever do those things. So here are a few of the places. It's a long list of scriptures that I'm going to read to you where this exact topic is mentioned. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, an atoning sacrifice, Mark 10, 45. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all. You don't realize that it is better for, one, <coughs> for you that one man die for all the people <clears throat> than that the whole nation should perish. Now, he didn't say this on his own, the author tells us, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for all those scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. What an interesting, interesting passage that truly is if you go to study it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ, our redeeming sacrifice. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood, Romans 3, 23 through 25. Christ Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit, Galatians 3, 13. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for many. 
the testimony given in its proper time, 1 Timothy 2. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are of his very own who are eager to do what is good. Are we eager to do what is good, church? Titus 2, 14. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Hebrews 9, 22. For you know that it was not without, with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed or bought back from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, 1 Peter 1.18. He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2.2. 2. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. Revelation 5, 9. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all. And therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them. And was raised again, 2 Corinthians 5.14. And just so you remember where we began, he was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. The punishment that brought you peace was on him, and by his wounds, you can be healed. I pray that you believe this. I pray that you will accept this truth as your own. Does this truth of Jesus' great love for you, does it compel you to love him more and more every day and to share that love with those around you? They desperately need it. Maybe you've denied his love up to this point in your life. Maybe you've tried to take care of things on your own. Maybe you've (coughs) tried to overcome the sin in your life all by yourself and it just isn't working He died for us so that we could live for him. And maybe you accepted that death part a long time ago, but you've not yet chosen to fully live for him. Would you consider doing that today and now forevermore? This is our Jesus. This is what he has done for you and quite honestly for everyone else as well. But they don't know it. We must share. Father God, as we consider the sacrifice that you made, the atonement for our sin that was offered, the expense that was paid, it's impossible for us to fully understand what that cost you. And yet you willingly gave it anyway. Father, we must embrace this truth as we enter into the celebration of this week and this month, this season, Father, of Christmas, and we celebrate the coming of your son. He came to do this. This is why he came, to offer his life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for us. May we never forget that. May that change our perspective on this season Father, you gave your son who gave his life for all people, all mankind. And so may that change the way we view every single person that we encounter. That person is someone that you died for. Every single one of them. Do they know that? Father, give us that discernment to ask that question, the courage to to just inquire if they even know who Jesus is. Give us the ability to explain this idea, Father, that you were pierced for our transgressions, that you, the way you suffered and died. Give us the words to say to share this truth with people so they understand how much you love them. We live in such a lonely world where people don't know your love. They don't know you. 
And we might be the only ones around in this moment to share that with them. And so, Father, give us the courage to do that this season. And, Father, if there's anyone here who, who Father, just, just took this passage a little differently today, maybe made it a little more personal today than it has been, then I pray they get to spend some extra time with you in prayer today. And they can fully accept that redeeming spirit that you offer us and help them heal. Father, we love you. Amen. We're going to end this service singing a couple of songs. I um, just want to encourage you guys to worship how you're able to this morning, whether that be singing a song, spending some time in prayer, even asking God some questions that you've wanted. He can answer them. So you guys would, feel free to stand if you want. You don't have to. Just, um, just glorify God in how you do it.
pastures we call grace, a mighty river flowing upward from a deep but empty grave. Oh, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. Cause you're the summit where my feet are. So I'll praise you in the valley all the same. No less God with I'm caught up in your presence, and I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessing Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you and I'm sorry I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Let's make this personal this morning. And I'm sorry.
deep in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, more than anything that you can do, and I just want you. moment here. Yeah, I'm on. They're good. Uh, yeah, come on. Come on down, Aaron and Joey. Can't, I can't see you at all, but I know you're there. <laughs> I talked to you earlier. <clears throat> this is Aaron Wagler and, and, his, and his mama, Joey Neely. <clears throat> is Paul still sick, the poor guy? Finally went to the doctor. All right. Well, they planned on everybody being here, uh, Joey's husband, Paul, as well, uh, to come and officially uh, have us adopt them into our family here at Berea. And so, <clears throat> hi, Paul. Uh, he's probably going to watch online, right? So, so we'll wave to him. So he's, he's joining us virtually <clears throat> to join the church uh, right now. And so uh, we're just so excited about that. Um, it's, it's been kind of a heavy morning. And uh, I don't know why God put things together like that. Uh, he did, though, and there's a reason for that. And that means that his spirit is ministering to the people his spirit needs to minister to. And um, that's always encouraging to me, um, that truth of the gospel and what Jesus did for us uh, is not something that we can ever ignore. It's not something we can ever speak on too much in the church. Um, it is the foundation for why we're here and why we believe. And so we've got to continually convey that and so however God can use that in your lives this week, this month, this season, I pray that he does. And so as a big old family, um, we get to, to join them and just repeat that last part of the, the good confession uh, that we too believe. So we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so if you would just welcome them. They'll be back in the back afterwards, but welcome them to Berea. <clears throat> If you are a guest or a visitor, we'd like you to fill out one of those Connect cards that's in the back of the seat right in front of you. Fill that out. Uh, Chris and I would like to get hold of you, just uh, chat with you about our service this morning. We've got a lot going on this week, and as I was sitting thinking of all the stuff that we've got going on, really what we've got going on this week is to fill us up, is to fill us up, that we can hang with our Christian brothers and sisters and get that recharge. So that's what this week is about. But the reason we recharge and we hang out with each other is so that we can go out and share the gospel with others. That's why we do what we do. Um, we got God and my girlfriends coming up uh, this Friday from 6 to 9. We've got God and my grill friends, the men's ministry, Saturday. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what we're going to have to eat that night because I've been mulling this over. What would be good? Well, the last time we had men's ministry, all of the food was eaten. And I know that after the women's ministry, there was a lot of leftovers. So ours is on Saturday. Theirs is on Friday. So I don't know what we're going to have to eat yet, but stay posted. Show up. It'll, it's going to be good one way or another. That was unscripted. I did not plan on saying that. Um, hey, we've got Blast Youth Ministry tonight. We're starting a new series called Lights, Camera, and Christmas, because a lot of times Christmas is a big production, and it's a lot of work, and that's not what it's about. So we're going to talk about that in Blast Student Ministries tonight. And then last, we've got these great little business cards here. We need to be about our father's business. And so on the way out, we have got excited, energetic people waiting. 
Am I right on that? Okay. All right. <laughs> if they're not excited and energetic when you get this, you come tell me or David. We'll get that straightened out, all right? Um, somebody in the back is doing cartwheels out in the foyer, and I'm not joking. He just kind of did. These business cards are made for you to take them and pass out to people that you meet so that we can invite them into the Father's house. We got the new sign out front to lead people to the church. They can start here at Berea, but then they become a part of the church. And so let's pray for that right now. Father, we ask as we leave today that we would leave and that we would be about your business, that we would be recruiting and sharing of what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. Father, I ask that as we go out today, as we go to restaurants and, and shopping stores and, and just even with our families, that we would show everyone the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.